Family Theater presents Wallace Ford and Lyle Betger. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Spy, starring Wallace Ford. And now, here is your host, Lyle Betker. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, The Spy, starring Wallace Ford as Softly. Applications, Captain Nelson. Uh, yes, Colonel, I'm almost finished. Just one more interview. Uh, no, sir, I don't think so. Uh, yes, sir, I'll come in just as soon as I'm finished here. Uh, yes, sir, goodbye. I'm sorry. Now, uh, what were you saying? I was saying I'd like to work for you people. Uh, you'd like to work for the CIC? You'd nearly have to use some older people in this line, wouldn't you? We do, sir. But the men we use who, uh, who have to look older have grown old in the work. They've made it a profession. For you to come into the Corps now would be like a, well, a 60-year-old housewife going to medical school. Ah, oh, that's being pretty blunt, isn't it? Well, maybe I shouldn't have stated it in quite that way. No, I don't think you should. I've got something here I want you to look at. There. Take a look at that. This? What's this? Snapshot. Well, it's very interesting, but who is it? Oh, well, nobody in particular. Give it back to me. Take it. Now, Mr. Jones, if you'll excuse me. No, I won't excuse you. At least not yet. Pardon me? You're not on your toes, Captain Nelson. In fact, you're getting downright sloppy. Here, you'd better keep this. The photograph? With your thumbprints all over the glossy side and latent prints of the rest of your fingers on the other. What? And you'd better have this as a CI man. It wouldn't do for you to have this kicking around. What's this? Just what it looks like. A magazine from an 8 millimeter camera. I've been taking your picture ever since I came in. You've been taking my picture? Well, I'd better be gone now, Captain. Nice talking to you. Uh, wait. Uh, don't worry, I won't tell anybody about this. If you won't. There's a saying in the army, and CIC is still the army, the saying goes shape up or ship out. Uh, wait, wait a minute. Like I said, nice talking to you. Fingerprints, pictures. You don't need to worry, I won't tell a soul. But I'd like to know who you are, you toothless old buzzard. Well, better see the colonel. Yes? Captain Nelson, sir. Come in. You wanted to see me, sir? Come in. Come in. Sit down, Captain. Thank you, sir. Tell me about that last man you interviewed. Uh, the last man, sir? Yes. When I spoke to you on the phone, you said you didn't think he was a very likely candidate for CIC. You did say that, didn't you? Yes, sir. Tell me about him. Well, sir, he, uh... He was quite old. Seemed quite old. Uh, seemed quite old. Uh, he, um, oh, his clothes were sort of shabby, and uh, he said he got the idea of coming over here from some motion picture he'd seen. Huh? Is that all? No, sir. What else? He took my picture and he got my fingerprints. <laughs> Made you feel pretty much like a dunderhead, huh? Yes, sir. How long have you been in the CIC, Nelson? Almost a year, sir. 
I came over from the Provo Marshal's office. I wouldn't be too upset about what just happened if I were you. Softly shaken up some of our best agents, men who've been with the Corps for a lot longer than a year. Did you say softly, sir? Yeah. What name did he give you? I, uh, I think it was Averill Jones. Well, his real name, at least the one on our pay roster, is Eric Softly. He works for CIC? That's right. One of the best we have. Cloak and dagger man of the old school, but just about the best. You see, you're going on assignment together. An assignment, sir? That's right, into East Berlin. Well, since you're going to be working with him, I think you have a right to an explanation. I got mine directly from him. It was just a little after World War II when I first met Eric Softly. I was a light colonel then, and I'd just been put in charge of this office. And if I remember correctly, my first impressions of the man were very much like yours. Don't you think it's a little late in life for you to think of taking up this kind of work, sir? If it were just beginning, it would be, Colonel. But I've been a spy since 1915. Pardon me? I said I've been a spy since 1915. Oh? For whom, may I ask? Germany. Yes. Well, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Softly... I didn't think you'd believe me, Colonel. That's why I brought this along. You mean the briefcase? There are a few things in this that might interest you. Well, maybe some other time, Mr. Softly. I have some very important business... Wait. Take a look at this. Huh? What is this? Those are the designs I sent to Germany as my last assignment. An assignment during the war just ended. It's a device for the manufacture of heavy water. Heavy water? That's right. One of the most necessary items in the manufacture of atomic weapons. Did you say you had some important business to take care of, Colonel? Never mind that. Where, where did you get these plans? Where does a spy get plans, Colonel? You sent these to Germany? Shortly before the war ended. If you'll have a qualified man go over those plans, you'll find that it required 12 times as many ball bearings in its construction as a panther tank, 15 times as many as a heavy bomber. But if it really works... It wouldn't. The designs for the most important component aren't in those plans, but the only way to find that out is to build the machine and try it. But still... And this. What's this? Schedules and locations of three convoys to England during 1943. Great Scott. You'll notice I've only listed points where interception would be possible, not lines of route. Tell me. Are these authentic? This one here is a German convoy of freighters en route to Germany from South America with a cargo of rubber. Hmm. To the commander of a wolf pack, it would be impossible to tell the difference between a German and an American convoy through a periscope. This German convoy was attacked and sunk by German subs. By German subs? That's right. But these others? The second is fictitious, and the third is a group of fully armed land lease destroyers en route to England. Destroyers? The submarine's worst enemy. But you said you were a German spy. And so I was, until very recently in the pay of Germany. But everything you've shown me indicates that you work for Germany's defeat. But they didn't know that, so they paid me for my information. Tell me, why are you showing me all this? So you'll know how I'm qualified to work for you. But why do you want to work for us? I've been working for this country for a long time, without pay. Now I just can't afford it anymore. You see, during the First World War, they landed me on the Atlantic coast. My duties were to observe and report on American shipping. That's what I did. You were actually a spy for Germany in World War I, and now you want us to take you into our competence. Certainly I worked for Germany in the First World War. I was a German, and I believed my country to be right. I watched shipping, and I reported on a lot of it, but then when the war ended, I was stranded. It's one of the occupational hazards of being a spy. I didn't know it then, but it was one of the greatest blessings of my life. You see, I'd gone from boyhood right into the military. He told me the story of his first years in the United I didn't States. Know any other At first, he lived on the money his supervisors had sent him to finance his espionage activities in the United States. It lasted till a year after the start of Prohibition. Then, although he was technically still an enemy alien, in the country illegally, he found a way to earn a living which was not far removed from what he'd been trained to do in the war. 
he offered himself to the Bureau of Internal Revenue as an investigator. But it wasn't for any newfound patriotism. It was strictly for money. Very few bootleggers made as much money during Prohibition as Eric Softly. And Eric did something most of the bootleggers couldn't do. He kept his money after the Roaring Twenties died with a gasp in 1929. I don't really know when the change came about in the man, the change that turned him from a misplaced German into an American. It might have been just the passage of time from 1930 to 1939. It might have been that he didn't like what Hitler was doing in the land of his birth. But whatever it was, it was brought to a head by Emily Hoffman, the woman he met at the one and only bun meeting he ever attended. I don't know what I actually... It was about 10 years difference in their ages. But when a woman's nearing 40 and a man is nearing 50, these things don't really matter much. They had something in common. Warm memories of a country that had ceased to be the old Germany. They enjoyed each other so much they, they kept company and Emily began to instill a new respect in Eric for the country she had come to love, America. Eric, do you think that they, these Bunders have a rule against smiling? They're so grim, so glum. Can you imagine a picnic with such people? <laughs> a picnic? I don't think my imagination is up to it. Did you go on picnics when you were a boy? Picnics? Mm -hmm. I went on hikes, long hikes, but I don't think I ever went on any picnics. Would you like to go on one with me? Where would we go? Oh, any place. Oh, there are so many wonderful parks. It would be nice if we had our picnic at home, wouldn't it? Well, we can if you like. In the backyard would be as good a place. I as mean in Germany. Oh. Do you still think of it as home? Don't you? Mm, no, no more. This is my home. America? There was never a land like this one, Eric. The old country has nothing to compare with what we have here. And the black forests, they're put to shame by the woods of New England, Colorado, and Montana. The laws, <sighs> never since the days of ancient Rome had the citizens of a country enjoyed so much protection under the law. And the people, hey, <sighs> is something the matter? Hmm, no, I suppose not. Why, you, you, you look so pensive. You love this country, don't you? Yes. Yes, I do. Today, a man called on me. Oh, a man? He got my name from the bun meeting. He asked me if I wanted to... Well, what he really wanted to know was, did I want to be a spy for Germany? A spy? That's what he meant. Well, but... Because you went to one meeting, he thought you would want to be a spy. You don't think I should do it? Be a spy against this country which has done so much for us? A country that makes freedom available for... for oh, well, you are making fun of me. Maybe a little. You would make a terrible spy anyway, Eric. You think so? Oh, even I could catch you. I'm afraid you would never make a good spy. No. I might make a wonderful spy. Sooner or later they would catch you and then take you away to prison. Or maybe even shoot you. Would you miss me? Oh, now you look serious again. Would you miss me, Emily? If you had been spying against this country, I wouldn't miss you. But if you had been spying against her enemies, I would miss you more than I can say, Eric. <laughs> The following spring, Eric Softly and Emily Hoffman had planned to be married. But in the middle of the preceding winter, the winter of 1939, Emily received word that her mother, still in Germany, had been taken ill. She went on what was to be a short visit. When spring came and Eric had received no word from her, he went to the one person he thought might be able to help him. You have been a long time making up your mind there, Softly. About your offer to renew my old occupation? 
Well, talents such as yours are rare. We will come to that. I've come to see you about something else. Hmm? Something I can do for you? Someone I know. A woman I met at the bun meeting. She went to Germany four months ago. Oh. I expected to hear from her by this time, but I... There hasn't been a letter. I, I thought you might help. Well, certainly. I'll be honored to do what I can. Her name? Emily Hoffen. She was going to Hamburg. Now, well, I call you when I have news, all right? I would appreciate it. Now, perhaps we might discuss my offer. When you have some news. As you wish, Herr Softly. <laughs> Schaefer. A little late to be calling, isn't it? It's three in the morning. It's three in the morning here. In Berlin, it's ten. The day is well begun. Come in. Come in. Yes, I've just finished talking with Berlin, as a matter of fact. I believe I have the news you wanted. About Emily Hoffman? What news do you have? Why are you interested in her? Does that make a difference? Well, I thought perhaps you might have been in her debt or uh, <laughs> something like that. If so, I have very good news for you. Go on. I was told at first that there was no Hoffman family living in Hamburg. But on further checking, I found that that was not always the case. What do you mean? What I mean is that they are not living there now. Will you please use plain words and say what you mean? They were Jews. You mean they are dead? Emily Hoffman is dead. That's right. Now, your interest in this Emily Hoffman was... Uh... You... You were right. I did owe her something. Well, <laughs> now you will not have to pay, eh? Won't I? Well, how can you pay the dead? A... A good question. What did you owe her? What did I owe her? A new land, sound of laughter, hope of sunlight. You speak in riddles here softly. I'm sorry. And you keep looking out that window. Just looking at the countryside in the moonlight. Peaceful, quiet. Now, shall we discuss my offer? Yes. I think the time is right for it now. during the war, Eric Softley worked at the only profession he knew, and he worked hard and well, in the pay of Germany, but in the interests of America. One of the most effective counterintelligence campaigns ever undertaken by one man. He sent performance records of American aircraft that were thoroughly believable, but were actually so doctored up, they'd scare the socks off the Luftwaffe pilots. He sent American coastal defense plans that made this nation look so powerful, the German high command almost abandoned the idea of trying to invade our shores. He sounds like quite a man. You'll find out how much of a man when you two go on your mission together. But, Colonel, the war with Germany is a thing of the past. If he still hates... I know what you mean. No, I don't think it's a matter of hate, Captain. And I don't think he's still working off a vendetta. Then how do you explain it, sir? Well, it's like the difference of being born into a faith and being converted to it, in one way. If you go out and get something, it means more to you than it does if you were born to it. But how do you account for the change in the man? It's very simple. He ran into something that changed him. Something that put everything in its right perspective. Captain, he learned how to love. This is Lyle Betger again. 
As I was walking about my yard last evening, my attention was captivated by a group of neighborhood children playing cops and robbers. And each one of them was playing his part as seriously as he could, making real the game of make-believe. And you know, I began to wonder if all life is only a game of make-believe. Sometimes I think it is. We see so many television shows and movies, read so many adventures and romances these days, that I wonder whether we are really living ourselves or attempting to live the lives of others in a perpetual game of let's pretend. After all, what is life and who are we? God has made each of us in his own way with special talents and all of us, man, woman, and child, are affected by the environment in which our Heavenly Father has placed us. We're creatures dependent on God and he lovingly watches over our lives and directs us along a special path so that each one of us may give him a special type of glory. Mother, father, brother, sister, office worker, farmer, truck driver, housewife, God has given each one of us a special role in life, a role with which we should be content, a role which we must face squarely and live out perfectly. Our Heavenly Father and Guardian wants us to be sincere with ourselves, and sincerity means being honest and truthful with ourselves and with each other living our own lives perfectly for his sake and not building fanciful castles in the air. A gold mine of happiness would be ours if we would devote all our time and energy to living our lives as they are. If every member of every family would try to practice this virtue of sincerity, many of the modern social evils of today would be less because we would learn and practice the lesson of give and take. Mother, father, son, daughter, you have a special role for God, for yourselves and for your family. Face it squarely, and life will be happier for you and everyone else. Don't let the golden opportunity of real life slip through your fingers while you waste time playing make-believe. Life is a precious God-given gift. Let us all get down on our knees daily and thank him for this gift and ask for the help to be sincere with ourselves and each other, remembering that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Hollywood Family Theater has brought you transcribed The Spy, starring Wallace Ford. Lyle Betker was your host. Others in our cast were Joe Forte, Sam Edwards, Gigi Pearson, and Tom Holland. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugh O'Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present... It Can't Happen Here... Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.